In this video, we're going to practice determining the type of intermolecular force that's present in a variety of different types of molecules. Now, if you're unfamiliar with dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, and intermolecular forces in general, I do want you to back up and watch the previous video. That is where I explain these three different types of forces, the differences between them, and how to identify them. So let's just jump right in. If you're given a problem like this, where you have a variety of molecules and you're asked to determine which intermolecular forces are present for that molecule, first thing that I want you to remember is that dispersion forces are present in all molecules. So all molecules are always going to be a yes for the dispersion force. Remember that the dispersion force is, is an attractive force that arises due to the natural movement of electrons in a molecule. And as long as a molecule has electrons, it has dispersion forces. So that one is very easy to classify. In my opinion, the next easiest force to classify is going to be the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonding is a very specific type of intermolecular force that exists between an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine from one atom and a hydrogen on an oxygen or a hydrogen on a nitrogen or a hydrogen on a fluorine. So there's some really specific criteria that a molecule has to meet in order to be eligible for hydrogen bonding. Specifically, it has to have a hydrogen and it also has to have an oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine, and they have to be put together in the right type of order. When we're looking at molecular formulas, a lot of times we can really quickly rule out hydrogen bonding. Like CCL4 doesn't have any hydrogens or oxygens or nitrogens or fluorines. And so there's just no way that this molecule can hydrogen bond. NOCL, it has nitrogens and oxygens, but again, no hydrogens, so no hydrogen bonding. And so we can move through this list pretty quick, just looking at the molecular formula. Here we've come to HBRO. It has a hydrogen and it has an oxygen. That doesn't necessarily mean that it can hydrogen bond. The hydrogen and oxygen have to be put together in the right order. We're going to have to look at its Lewis structure. H2 is a no. CH2, Cl2 is a no. H2O, possibly, um, because we have the right atoms, we just have to make sure that they're assembled correctly. And the I3- minus is definitely a no. So we've very quickly narrowed down which atoms might be eligible for hydrogen bonding. And again, in order for us to determine for sure if it can hydrogen bond, we need to know what the Lewis structure of that molecule looks like. Now, because I am an old chemist and I just know off the top of my head a lot of different Lewis structures, I'm going to draw off to the side here the Lewis structures for these molecules. Um, as a student, you would probably have to you know, go through the steps of drawing those Lewis structures out or... Hint, hint, you can just Google Lewis structure of HBRO and the internet is gonna tell you what it looks like. So we can see here that we do have the OH that's necessary in order for hydrogen bonding to occur. So this is a yes for hydrogen bonding and we're gonna see the hydrogen of one HBRO molecule attracted to the oxygen of a second HBRO molecule. So we'll see something like that. And then water, which was an example that I used in the last video, um, uh, hydrogen bonding as well. So now we're ready to tackle this column here, the molecules that experience the dipole force. This one's the hardest one out of all of them to do. Um, remember, the dipole force is present in any molecule that is polar. So in order for us to know if the dipole force is a yes or a no, we have to know if this molecule is polar or if the molecule is nonpolar. And that again requires us to not only look at the Lewis structure of the molecule, but imagine what it looks like in three dimensions, think about the polarity of each individual bond. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Before we get too deep into this, I did tell you in the last video that if a molecule experiences hydrogen bonding, it's also a yes for the dipole force. It's definitely gonna be polar. So we've got a couple of these that we can just automatically do without putting a lot of thought into it. So let's go ahead and tackle the rest of them. And again, fortunately, um, because I'm an old chemist and I know a lot of Lewis structures off the top of my head, I'm just going to start randomly drawing some of them over here. I'm just going to pick these two for starters, CS2 and CO2, which are both very similar molecules. If we look at those two molecules, they've got really nice symmetry to them. Um, they, if we imagine our tug of war game, nobody's going very far in that game of tug of war. Or if we imagine this in terms of adding vectors together, the overall vector is a zero. These are both nonpolar molecules because they're nonpolar. They do not experience the dipole dipole force. 
Let's look at the H2 molecule next. That's a pretty simple molecule, not much going on there. It's also a nonpolar molecule with no dipole-dipole force. And let's see, what could we look at next? I3 minus, this was one that we drew the Lewis structure of um, a few times in a few videos. And it looks like this. And we determined that I3 minus was a nonpolar molecule. So that means it's also a no for the dipole-dipole force. CH2Cl2 is a tetrahedral molecule. It's a little bit tricky to be able to see the polarity. You've got to really be able to envision what this looks like three-dimensionally. Um, but because of the shape of the tetrahedral molecule, when it is uh, doesn't have all four bonds exactly the same, it is going to be a polar molecule. CH3Cl is a very similar molecule. So here's its Lewis structure. And again, due to the asymmetry of this molecule, it's polar, which means it has a dipole-dipole force. NOCl, that one's a little bit tricky. I'm, I'm going to skip ahead to CCl4. So this is a very symmetrical molecule. And if we put all of our electrons on those chlorines, we can see that this is a totally symmetrical molecule. So that molecule is nonpolar, has no dipole force on it. And then as far as the NOCl molecule, just by the sheer virtue of the fact that we have three different atoms in this molecule, no matter how we think about maybe we're going to lay this molecule out, not even really knowing which atom might be in the center, the fact that we have three different atoms, there's no way for this molecule to have perfect symmetry, it's going to end up being a polar molecule. So we'll say yes for dipole-dipole. Let's move on to the next task. The other thing that I wanted to practice doing with you is ranking a set of molecules according to their boiling point. So boiling point, again, the temperature at which the substance boils, this is totally connected to the intermolecular forces. The molecule that has the strongest or the highest intermolecular force is going to be the one that has the highest boiling point. So when we are being asked to rank them according to boiling point, what we're really being asked is to rank them according to their intermolecular forces. And we want to give a 1 to the molecule that has the highest intermolecular uh, force and the highest boiling point. So what we want to do, first of all, is just ask ourselves which intermolecular forces are present in all of these and which one is the strongest. Remember that they all have the dispersion force, every single one of them, everything has the dispersion force. Now let's look for hydrogen bonding. In order to hydrogen bond, we have to have oxygens or nitrogens or fluorines, and we also have to have hydrogens that are attached to them. So this molecule cannot hydrogen bond. Um, this molecule doesn't have hydrogen, so it can't hydrogen bond. And this molecule has the nitrogen with a hydrogen on it, so it's capable of hydrogen bonding. So we'll make a list. We'll, we'll add that to its list. And if it hydrogen bonds, that means it also has dipole-dipole. Um, and this one is not doing any hydrogen bonding as well. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of all the intermolecular forces, and this is our only molecule that has hydrogen bonding. So this one is going to have the highest boiling point. We'll give that a number one. So for these other two, we're going to be looking, or the other three, we're going to be looking at polarity. This is a nonpolar molecule, which means it has no dipole-dipole. The only force it has is dispersion. This molecule is asymmetrical, so we know that it's going to have some polarity to it, so it's going to have a dipole-dipole force. And this molecule also has polar bonds, so it will also have the dipole-dipole force. So because this molecule over here only has dispersion forces, which are the weakest of all of them, we're going to give this guy a number four. It is the lowest. So these two over here, they look kind of the same. I mean, they both have dispersion forces and they both have dipole-dipole forces. What do we do in a situation like this? Well, when we are tied in terms of intermolecular forces, the next thing that we should be considering is the weight of the molecule. How heavy is that molecule? Remember that in order to boil molecules, not only do we have to separate them from each other, but we have to also get them up into the air and get them moving. And the heavier they are, the harder it is for them to boil. So a big heavy molecule is going to always have a higher boiling point than a small light molecule. Let's practice with one more example. We've got another one down here um, for us to rank. So we have got, let's see, if we're looking at these, we know that everything has dispersion forces. 
as I'm looking at these, I cannot see any one of them that has hydrogen bonding. So we have no hydrogen bonding present at all. This is a nonpolar molecule. So this is a molecule that will only have dispersion forces, nothing else. Um, this looks like it is also a nonpolar molecule, so only dispersion forces, nothing else. This is a molecule that is polar due to the carbon-oxygen bond, so this is going to be dispersion forces plus dipole forces. And what the heck is even going on over here? We just have a cobalt atom all by itself. This is kind of a trick question, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to use it as an example. This isn't even a molecule. It's just a cobalt atom. It's a metal atom. Uh, and at room temperature, it is literally a metal. So imagine how difficult it would be to take a piece of cobalt and turn it into a gas. I mean, that's going to require a lot of heat. Again, that's kind of a trick question, kind of a, kind of a mean question. So anytime you're looking at just a straight metal, it's always going to have the highest boiling point. So of these remaining three, we only have one of them that has the dipole force. So that is going to be our second highest boiling point. These two both have only dispersion forces. So now we have to look at how heavy they are. The hydrogen gas, H2, that is a very light, small molecule. So it will have a very low boiling point.